silently the great forest grows. And in the church, James the Less, we can see him as a precursor of all those who trust Christ, who humbly follow their God, who sought to serve Him in some small corner of the harvest field. They are unknown, unsung heroes of the faith. I remember years ago, uh, I was 17 years old of age. I had just uh, answered the call to preach on my life, told God I would do whatever He wanted me to do. Uh, I was riding, my dad and I, we were having a conversation about it, and that's, that was a very cool thing to be able to talk to my dad about the call of God on my life and him being able to pour into me during those years when I was really questioning what that meant, you know. And uh, we just talked, and, and he said, well, you believe God's called you to preach. And I would, I would usually preface that. I've said I would preach if God wants me to. I, 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 I want to do what God wants me to, and I believe that's it. But if that's it, that's what I want to do. And And we started talking about people who were influential in my life. Uh, And and my dad referenced a man who had pastored, I I believe he ended up pastoring more than 50 years in the same church in a small town in rural Alabama. And we talked about him for a few moments. And then dad began to talk about people around the country serving the Lord and around the world who had gone out as missionaries who had come from this little small church in rural Alabama that, and, and that just started, I began to think about, you see the, the tentacles of that church and that man's ministry go out. And this man, if I called his name, nobody here would know him and nobody in thousands of churches like ours would ever know, uh, know who he is. But God used him tremendously as he served faithfully year after year after year in a small rural church on the backside of nowhere. That's the kind of person James seems to be. We don't know his name. We, actually, we do know his name. But that's the only thing we know about him. We know his name. We know his father's name. And we, we know he might have been young or short when God called him. But that's all we know. There's a lot of examples in history. I begin to think about people uh, who toiled in relative obscurity. Most of you know the name John Wesley, right? Does, does anybody not? Raise your hand if you know who John Wesley was. Okay, you at least know the name, John and Charles Wesley. Um, The historian, William Leckie, declared that the Wesleyan revival saved England from the bloodbath of the French Revolution. He went went so far as to say that the religious revolution begun in England by the preaching of the Wesleys was more important than all the victories won on land and sea under the British Prime Minister. William Leckie didn't claim to be a Christian, uh, he didn't claim to know God. He just claimed that what the Wesleys did and, and their work and seeing people saved changed the history of England. Um, not, to, not to give you a, a complete history lesson, uh, but during the time of the Great Awakening, this revival that began, the church in England was openly scorned. Religion was a joke. Um, drunkenness, infidelity was an epidemic in the churches all across England. Um, it is said that in that day in London, in London, one house in every six was a gin mill. Uh, vandals would go from tavern to tavern uh, and in between causing chaos among citizens. The priest of the Church of England, um, one, one historian said, to find a safe minister among the priest of the Church of England was as rare as a comet. This is a historian of a century ago. Every kind of immorality was championed by the press. It was taken for granted that Christianity was defunct, no longer even subject for an inquiry. Then men like John and Charles Wesley came on the scene. John, John Wesley in his own journal said he's always been religious. He, would, he told the story that as a boy he would steal from his mother's purse but he always tithed on what he stole. <laughs> That's a definition of religion without Christ, right? Uh, he crossed the Atlantic to become a missionary only to discover while he was on the mission field that he wasn't right with God himself. He returned to England and he 
for a while he waffled back and forth between uh, what he ought to do and, and, and whether or not he was even saved. Uh, and he said this later in his journal. He said, I learned that I went to America to convert the Indians, but I was never myself converted. His journal tells us that he came to Christ when he was persistently pursuing the truth. He went to a meeting. Uh, it was, it was a, the Christian Society in London. Someone had invited him to go. He kind of felt pressured to go. He didn't want to go, but he thought he ought to go. And of all things, what was read that night was Martin Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans. That wouldn't be light reading, just so you know. And John Wesley said about a quarter way through that reading, the light suddenly dawned on my soul. The man who was destined to bring revival to England was saved. But who invited John Wesley to that meeting? Who read Martin Luther's commentary and the preface to Romans? We don't know. It's one of the church's nobodies. John Wesley went on to write 118 books. He and his brother Charles uh, published 49 hymns and 49 books of hymns and poetry. John Wesley traveled some 250,000 miles, mostly on horseback. He preached over 40,000 sermons, led countless thousands of people to Jesus Christ. But who led him? Who led John Wesley to Christ? It was someone like James the Less. We don't know their name. We don't know who it was. Let's keep going. Alexander Cruden. How many of you know his name? Some of you know something that he has written, but you don't know that you know it. He was born on May the 31st of 1701. He was known as Crazy Cruden. I kind of feel a kinship to him. Growing up, people would call my brothers and I the Crazy Cashes, right? I don't know why. We still hear that from time to time. But Crazy Cruden, uh, he, on several occasions, it is said that he displayed evidence of mental instability. I won't tell you his whole story, uh, but Alexander Cruden compiled a concordance of the Bible. How many of you have ever seen, ever held, ever looked at Cruden's concordance of the Bible? Most of you have. If you've got a concordance, look at it. It might be Cruden's concordance. I mean, today we have all kind, we have a plethora of, uh, uh, of books at our disposal and now online. Matter of fact, my concordances are, are all digital now. Uh, but if you know one word, if you know one word of a Bible verse, you can find it in Cruden's Concordance and you can find that Bible verse. And the cross references, when I first began uh, to preach, and crawl, I can remember many times looking through Cruden's Concordance to cross reference Bible. But who led Alexander Cruden to Christ? Nobody knows. It was someone like James the Less. I want to mention a man by the name of John Knox. Um, his colleague, George Weishart, was burned at the stake as a heretic. John Knox escaped arrest that day, but he watched his mentor, Weishart, die. Knox actually saw him being led away by the executioner and heard him offer the executioner his forgiveness. In 1547, John Knox was arrested, sent to France, where he is condemned to be a galley slave for 19 months. Matter of fact, um, in biographies of John Knox, uh, there was a Roman Catholic priest on the slave ship where he was rowing, and uh, he would often stand up and speak against the Roman Catholic priest and his prayers and all that. When Knox returned to Scotland from his exile, he bluntly declared the Catholic Mass to be idolatry. He stated that Catholic churches and monasteries should be closed. He lived, um, he lived in an era when that, of course, was against the national religion, and he was considered a heretic. Uh, when, when Mary Stuart came to the throne in 1560, she promptly had Knox arrested, tried for treason. He was acquitted uh, at that time. But Thomas Carlyle, the famous Scottish historian, said that in the history of Scotland, he could only find one period, the Reformation wrought by John Knox. Carlyle described it as a resurrection for the dead for Scotland. And who led John Knox to Christ? We know Wise of Heart. 
was his mentor, but who led him to cap Christ? We don't know. It was someone like James the Less. I've got a bunch of these. Can I share one more? Uh, any of you ever heard of John Bunyan? What do you know about John Bunyan? If you have never read Pilgrim's Progress, let me encourage you to read Pilgrim's Progress. Not the abridged version, not the children's version, and not even the, virgin, the version that's written in today's English. Read the original Pilgrim's Progress. I'll tell you, uh, when I was about 14 years of age, uh, I had a copy for some reason. I'd get, been given a copy or it would hand, handed down to me or whatever. And when I was about 14, and I, I enjoy reading. I love to read. But I like to read for one of two things. If I'm not reading to study a passage of Scripture um, and studying that, I like to read for, I want to read for pleasure. And it can be a biography, autobiography. I love biographies. Or I want to read something practical that just how to, you know, how to do this. How to, how to be a better organizer. I'm, I'm a, I'm a, uh, uh, one of my hobbies is or organization. You know, I, I love to read about it, think about it, talk about it, but I ain't about it. Um, but I like how-tos. This is how to, you know, I like practical books or um, uh, reading for pleasure. And, and I, I've, since I was very young, I've loved to read, enjoyed reading. Um, but Pilgrim's Progress is not a book you pick up to read for pleasure, the original book, especially when you're 14 years of age. Uh, but I started reading it, and somehow, somewhere along the way, God used that book in my life. The alleg it's an allegorical story, right? Allegory. And um, it's amazing. So let me encourage you. Let, if you have never read Pilgrim's Progress, you can get a copy for 10 bucks. You can get a digital copy if you want to. Go get a copy and read it. All right? That's my challenge. Go read Pilgrim. John Bunyan... Uh, God used him. John Bunyan was in prison. He was in the Bedford prison, I believe, that he had been thrown. Uh, he was in prison, and he had a dream, and after his dream, he began to write this. Um, and, and you remember the main character in the study of Pilgrim's Progress? You remember the main character's name? Christian, right? And, every, and, and he, he comes across Mr. Obstinate and, he, and he, you know, pride and all, all of these people. Anyway, and, and, and the thing, you remember, what his, you remember what he was carrying with him the whole time? His burden, which was, it was a what? Just a big boulder tied to his back, right? And he was carrying it. And, and all of that symbolism, uh, man, it's, it's God used this book Again, like I was a 14-year-old ornery teenager, and uh, I honestly was, I, I, have, I can't say I've read a lot of things that made me tear up uh, just out of the blue, uh, but God used that book. And, and, and not, not just me, but, but countless thousands of other people. Um, he, he begins the book like this. I, I wrote this phrase, As I walked through the wilderness of this world, I lighted on a certain place where there was a den, and I laid me down in that place to sleep, and as I slept, I dreamed a dream. And that den was the Bedford Jail. The dream became Pilgrim's Progress, um, and God used him tremendously. We, we know about the book, but God used him in his day and time tremendously. Um, Pilgrim's Progress, the Holy War, and Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners, he wrote. But who led John Bunyan? Who, who led John Bunyan to the Lord? We don't know. It was somebody like James the Less. James the Less stands in the forefront of a multitude that we won't be able to number of anonymous men and women, boys and girls, who are washed in the blood of the Lamb, whose names are written in glory. They may stand in a dark corner somewhere when it comes to those who receive awards on this earth for standing up and speaking out. No bright lights shine on their names, but they'll shine as the stars in the firmament of heaven forever. We don't know about James the Less. We don't know much about him, but we know he was a silent servant. So then lastly, let's notice his destination. One of these days, we're going to hear a shout, and the trumpet's going to, sh going to sound. 
And 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16 says, The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. We'll all be there. Those who have their names written in bright lights, those who are the first to be called on. Um, I, I am, um, some of you may or may not know the name Clarence Sexton. Clarence Sexton uh, pastored in uh, Tennessee, outside of Knoxville, Tennessee, uh, Temple Baptist uh, uh, Church, uh, Crown College, has a, uh, an, an amazing school there, an amazing college. Uh, I became acquainted with Clarence Sexton probably 30 years ago, started listening to his preaching. Uh, thousands of people have been influenced by his preaching, and they, um, he passed away just a few weeks ago. And the college that he started is uh, contemplating, they want to build something in his honor, a, a monument or a building or something, which, which I... I I'm fine. I, you know, the man's died. He's passed away. He's in glory. If somebody wants to do that, that's fine. If they, if they can use, um, use, use it that way. But, you know, there's a lot of people who serve the Lord all their life very faithfully. And when they pass away, nobody's putting up a monument in their name. And nobody's uh, donating money in their name. And nobody's, but they serve God faithfully. And no matter where we stand, and no matter... Uh, how publicly we, or how public we are in the eyes of people, one day we'll all stand before the Lord. And it doesn't matter, it matters little whether we're known here on earth, but it matters for eternity if we're known in heaven. That's what's important. will stand before the Lord. There are the names of these 12 apostles engraved in the foundations of our world. And just as prominent as Peter, James, and John, there is the name of James the Less. And, and you know, we could say this about the majority of the apostles, not every one of them, but the majority of them, we would say they would be considered uneducated, I mean, it was said of, of Peter and John in Acts chapter, Acts chapter 2 that they are unlearned and ignorant. Basically, they're uneducated men. They hadn't gone to the finest schools. They hadn't sat in the finest synagogues. They hadn't learned from the greatest teachers. But the Lord uses all kinds of unqualified people, doesn't He? I read about a concert violinist who rented out a great hall and announced that he would play a concert on a $20,000 violin. Ken, you've got some pretty expensive guitars. You got a $20,000 one? No. Would you have one if, if you could? If you could get one? Yeah, oh yeah, here you have one. This violin had the place packed with violin lovers, music lovers. He came out and he played exquisitely. And, and, and you know, some people sit down at an instrument or piano, guitar, or whatever, and, and you've all, most of you have been spellbound by somebody playing just like, man, this is just, this is awesome. And that's exactly what was happening. He, he played exquisitely. And when he was done, they applauded and applauded. He stood up, took a bow took in their applause, and he threw the violin on the ground and stomped it into several pieces. People were horrified. There's a $20,000 violin in pieces. He walked off the stage. They were aghast. They were trying to figure out what just happened. The stage managers came out and said, Ladies and gentlemen, to put you at ease, that was not a $20,000 violin. That was closer to a $20 violin. But now he's going to come out and play the $20,000 violin. And you know what? They couldn't tell the difference. It's not the instrument as much as it is the artist. 
Now, I, I, know, I know, don't, don't misunderstand. I know if you get technical and, you know, some instruments, the more you put into them, the better they sound, right, Ken? I mean, there, there's, there's some, but it doesn't matter how much you pay for an instrument, no one's going to pay to hear me play it. Agreed? Let's face it. Most of us are way closer to the $20 violin than we are the $20,000 violin. Would you agree with that? But oh, what kind of music can our master make with us? The focus isn't on the human tool. The focus is on the Savior. It isn't the instrument. It's the musician. It's not the paint or the canvas, it's the artist. It's not the clay, it's the potter. The problem comes when we think we're the $20,000 instrument. When we think we deserve to have our name in lights, or we deserve to have a building named after us. Or we, and, and, and you say, preacher, I never, I never thought about that, but when we think... That God is blessed to have us in His service. That's when the problem comes. And that's when we cannot be used. God is going to use us. We talked about this Sunday night. When we have a proper assessment of who we are. Then we can see Jesus for who He is. And I kind of said that reverse. We have to see God for who He is before we can see ourselves for who we really are. But when we see God for who He is, we see Jesus as the creator of the universe and the King of kings, and we're able to see us who we are in relation to Him, and we know, we acknowledge, if I'm worth anything, it may be $20. Then God can use us. And then God can do some amazing things. And then we can give God the glory. Isn't that, was, isn't, isn't that what you want to do with you? Don't you want to live your life for the glory of God? We've got to see ourselves for who we are and humbly allow God to use us how God wants to use us. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your love and your mercy, your goodness to us. Thank you for honoring us with your presence. And Lord, help us to see ourselves for who we really are. Help us to acknowledge that we are not anything without you. The Apostle Paul and all his earthly accolades claimed it was just waste to him now when he came to know who he was in Christ Jesus. And Lord, help us to know who we are in Christ Jesus. Use us beyond our capabilities. Use us for your glory. In your name we pray. Amen. I know I didn't give you